welcome to all the participants joining this webinar on mitigating post exit risk in pe mna deals for today's session we have an external panelist mandira gupta from marsh insurance broker as most of you will know mandira is a famous name in pe mna circles and is an expert on placing warranty and indemnity and tax insurance policies for pe mna deals the reason why we thought it would be good to have mandira for this panel is because there are number of clients who are asking questions to us and to mandira on what will change with respect to the issuance of the warranty and indemnity policy and the tax insurance policy post covid 19 since covid 19 is a significant event uh, as far as ensuring risk on mnap deals is concerned our session is going to be divided into two parts the first part will deal with warranty and indemnity insurance and the second part we will deal with tax insurance but before we deep dive into the nuances of warranty and indemnity insurance and the tax insurance i think it will be important to spend couple of minutes on why the warranty and indemnity and tax insurance are important for mna deals and pe deals i think all of us know that in 2008 when daichi acquired ranbaxi at that time the deal was hailed as one of the best pharma deals in the country but what happened later was in an years time there was a huge penalty that was slapped on ranbaxi because certain filings and certain data that was submitted to us fda by ranbaxi was improper and false and that's where the importance of warranty and indemnity insurance also comes in because some of the things as far as the daichi ranbaxi deal were concerned the founders of ranbaxi malvinder and shivender singh uh, as per the court order had hidden certain internal reports which clearly mentioned that more than 200 drugs uh, Uh, for which the filings were done uh, those drugs were not uh, up to mark and there were false reports that were submitted to us fda now the penalty for this came to almost 500 million us dollars on ranbaxi and that was something which came after the acquisition so it was more to do with the post exit risk uh, for the founders now why i'm explaining this example is maybe the maybe things would have been different if there was an insurance policy for a transaction like this and you know we can we can discuss this in greater detail going forward but the important part is that even if due diligence is conducted in mnap transaction there is always an element of risk if something has been hidden and if what has been hidden has not been expressly captured in the form of rep or warranty and hence it's important that the reps and warranties are robust in any pmna transaction and the rep and warranties are backed by warranty and indemnity insurance the other interesting case was the lilliput case where again uh, there was a falsification of accounts uh, by the by the management and uh, uh, as we know uh, one of the large private equity fund lost money in that similarly there was another case of shubiksha retail Uh, where again the promoter was involved in a fraud uh, uh, with respect to the banks so there have been instances and cases of frauds in the last 10 years in india and that's where the warranty and indemnity insurance becomes very very important because if there is a fraud you not just lose the the return you lose the capital also in the company and that could be a, a significant issue for the lps uh who have invested money in the fund so with that uh, let me uh, ask for my first question to simon on what are the market standards simon as far as the reps and warranties and indemnities are concerned and are there any specific scenarios which you feel uh, would be more suited for taking this warranty and indemnity insurance thanks mr and uh, welcome andhra 
Um, so let me sort of, you know, talk about what a representation and what it really is and why is it important in any m and transaction. Now you have two kinds of m and transactions. One is where you have a secondary acquisition and the other is where you infuse capital into, into the company and the company becomes your only counterpart. The target becomes your only counterpart. Now, um, you know, in both these circumstances, acquirers want a specific set of facts with respect to the company uh, or the target to be made. So representations and warranties are nothing but statements of fact in regards to what the target, what, what the condition of the target really is. Um, they are quite long um, and, they, and they present a near perfect picture of what the target really is. But you have the ability to disclose any imperfections or any exceptions to that representation and warranty. The intent is for the acquirer who is acquiring or the newcomer into this target company to know or have a full idea of what the company really is. And if there is a breach of those representations and warranties, for him to be covered for any loss that he may suffer as a result of such breach. Now, you may ask, you know, uh, why is this really important? It is because uh, valuations and pricing of a deal are, are, are sort of arrived at assuming or taking into account a certain um, state of the target and a certain state of the financial condition of this target, uh, a, certain, um, a certain sort of, uh, you know, prospects of the, of, of the target, um, the clientele of the, of the target, um, and also the fact that the company is really not subject to any liabilities which have not been disclosed to the acquirer. So therefore, the valuation and the reason why an acquirer is coming into this company is really on the, on the backbone of these representations and warranties. Now, of course, an acquirer would be foolish to just rely on, on representations and warranties. You would have to, um, you know, the acquirer always does due diligence, and um, it is important that the acquirer also does his own due diligence because it's the buyer beware, um, you know, a buyer has to be, 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 be cognizant of what he's getting into. Um, but, uh, but representations and warranties are a standard requirement for any m and transaction. Now, uh, with respect to how you are protected for any loss, that is where the indemnity contract comes into play. Now, the indemnity contract is a, is a, is a contract to make good uh, the loss that, you, that the acquirer may suffer in the event of a breach of the representations and warranties. Um, and it is heavily negotiated in terms of what it covers, in terms of time, in terms of quantum in terms of uh, you know how the process it is a it is a contractually um, agreed on document uh, and a clause a, a very tightly sort of agreed on agreement in terms of how um, a buyer would be protected now typically you would ask for the seller who is receiving consideration or the company who is receiving consideration uh, to make these representations and warranties um, with respect to the business and operations of the company now Again, representations and warranties are quite long and can be divided into two basic uh, subsects. One is a fundamental set of representations and warranties, which is fundamental to the asset that you are purchasing. And in most M&A transactions, it could be shares or could be the asset that you are actually buying. The, the other, and, and of course, authority capacity to actually contract. So these are fundamental in nature, title to the asset, as well as um, the, the, the ability to uh, authority and capacity to execute the document. The next sort of set of representations and warranties are business representations and warranties that state or give you a fair idea of, what, of the business operations of the company and include compliance with applicable law, uh, anti-bribery, uh, tax representations, compliance with applicable law, contractual issues, labor issues, and so on and so forth. So these are really the two subsects of um, representations and warranties. Now, you may ask, you know, if there's an indemnity cover that has been sought, um, there is a, a business representation warranty that has been made, you know, wherein lies the scope for an insurance product. Now, many sellers today, um, and let's sort of subgroup the kinds of sellers we've seen. 
We've seen situations where private equity investors are selling um, their shares to um, a, 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 another private equity investor. We've seen situations where individuals are selling shares to another private equity investor. We've seen distressed deals where distressed companies are selling assets to, um, to, to an acquirer. And we've seen general corporates selling, um, selling assets to another acquirer. Um, and of course, companies, companies raising cash into the, the company fold. Now, with respect to the different subsects of, of sellers, um, let's talk about you know, where the insurance product, what the insurance product really is, and why it is um, a good substitute for, indemn for an indemnity contract. The insurance product really substitutes the obligation to indemnify, and the insurer really bears the risk for, um, for in, in connection with this uh, insurance, in connection with any loss that the acquirer may suffer um, as a result of these, um, as a result of uh, the breach of representation and warranty. Now, I'm sure Mandara will go into what kinds of um, insurance products there are, because they can be a seller uh, policy, they can be a buyer policy. I'm going to stick to a buyer policy because a buyer policy is where the buyer is really the insured, uh, the insured um, under uh, under this policy, and the buyer is entitled to really recover from the insurer. Now, um, in in this situation, again, you know, you would see many reasons why sellers. Um, want for buyers to to get uh, a buy side policy, and and buyers may also want for, for to get the buy side policy. Now, um, let's talk about why sellers would want um, a buyer to get an insurance product, um, especially with respect to private equity funds or distress funds. The intent when you are exiting is to have a clean exit and not really to have any liabilities hanging over your head that you may not really know about especially private equity investors, where you have, where, where private equity investors, even though they hold large positions in, in companies, are not generally uh, responsible for the operation, operations and management of the company that is really left to the management of the company. So it is really difficult with respect to, um, it is really difficult with respect to, to, to actually for a private equity investor to, to make representations and, and stand behind business representations. The second issue is that for private equity investors, you have uh, an indemnity can be considered a contingent liability in their books. So how do you really make provisions in your books when you are actually sort of exiting out is another question that private equity investors really, really face. The third issue is really when you have an exit, uh, the proceeds in a private equity fund are really distributed to its LPs. Now, once the proceeds are distributed, if you have a contingent liability, how do you sort of provision for it, and how do, what amount of cash does the private equity investor continue to retain, and for how long uh, to make good any claim that may arise uh, on a going forward basis? Um, and the last bit is most private equity investors are really, you know, SPV funds, um, and in that situation may not really have the asset wherewithal to cover a loss on a going forward basis. In which case, acquirers look for, you know, parent backstop, or sometimes even ask GPs for uh, for guarantees. That becomes difficult for um, a private equity fund to actually manage. So for all these reasons. Uh, the insurance product really becomes very useful because what it does is it takes away this liability and the insurer um, it takes over or, uh, or steps into the shoes of the indemnity provider um, and really takes over any liability that comes as a result of any loss that may be suffered um, by the acquirer. So, um, so, so of course there are exclusions uh, which we can cover later, but in general this is the, um, this is, this is the gist. Now, buyers today also um, would like for insurance covers, um, especially and, and, and be the insured person, because if you have a seller that has maybe a weak balance sheet, or if you have an individual seller that, you know, where assets are not known, it becomes difficult to enforce an indemnity claim. And especially in the Indian situation where, you know, litigation and lit litigating is quite uh, extensive um, and it's, it's not necessarily time bound, uh, it becomes difficult to claw back from individuals, distressed companies, and so on and so forth. In which case, if you have an insurance counterpart who has uh, agreed to the risk, it becomes a, a, a more plausible 
far better sort of option uh, to actually take uh, as opposed to relying on an indemnity contract. So in general, I think these are the reasons why you would see uh, the insurance product really be, being very handy uh, in, in M&A transactions. Thanks, Simon. I think one more situation which uh, we have also seen is uh, in post uh, the global financial crisis in 2008, we saw a number of club deals happening in India where two or three private equity funds uh, came together and invested in the portfolio company or jointly acquired the portfolio company uh, where the promoter was in minority. So even though individually some of these PE funds may be between 20 to 25 percent uh, collectively if they are three together then <clears throat> they were collectively holding about <clears throat> 75 to 80 percent of the share holding of the portfolio company with the promoter holding the balance 20 percent now some of these companies which were acquired by this uh, club p investors uh were uh, or are uh, getting sold now or got sold in the last couple of years and when they got sold uh, to a strategic, uh, from a strategic perspective, this was a uh, M&A transaction. And hence, even though individually the PE were was holding 20 to 25 percent and not involved in day-to-day -day business, uh, there were transactions where some of these PEs had to even uh, give business warranties or business indemnities relating to these warranties. And that's where this product became came quite handy for some of these PE funds for the reasons that you mentioned, Simon. Uh, but let me uh, switch to Mandira. Uh, Mandira, it will be good uh, to share your experience in the last decade uh, placing the warranty and indemnity insurance policy for uh, uh, India PE and m and deals. Uh, but more importantly, I think the audience to know on COVID-19 and how COVID-19 is going to impact the placement of some of these policies going forward, uh, both globally and in India. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Nishchal, and thanks, NDA team, for inviting me for this event. Uh, I'd like to echo what uh, you and, and Simone have been saying, that there has been a serious uptake in the utilization of WNI policy, warranty and indemnity insurance policy in India. And the reasons, like Simone mentioned, are you know many fold, which is including fraud, a number of private equity funds making in investments in India over the last decade, uh, overall taking majority positions, and therefore it becomes a challenge in terms of how they make a successful exit without having to give any contingent liabilities. I think we all agree that private equity funds being financial sponsors want to make an exit. Uh, a clean exit without any contingent liability, and that's what this product helps with. And therefore, my experience of working with Marsh for many years now is that there has been a serious uptake in the utilization. Uh, it, I think, started in India about seven, eight years back when there were fewer policies, but now it's reached a point where literally for all secondary transactions, all, all control transactions, most of the private equity transaction, at least WNI policy is discussed as a viable solution. It is a situation where a uh, solution which is which is discussed at length on a number of transactions, and it is no longer a band-aid approach, which basically meant that earlier on it used to be done when uh, clients couldn't find a solution to bridge the gap between the buyer and seller on, say, the indemnity caps or, say, survival periods. It's now reached a place where clients have started using it upfront when the transaction is being thought about, when it's being designed. Uh, insurance is being thought at the upfront such that it is part of the entire process. And that's the real change that we've seen. This also means that there has been a change in the number of insurers who've been providing insurance in India. Uh, many years back, it used to be one or two insurers who would uh, who would look to do Indian transaction and that would make them uh, expensive uh, for lack of uh, for lack of competition. But over the last couple of years, we've seen six, seven insurers now actively looking at India, actively competing in, uh, on Indian transaction which obviously means better coverage and also means, you know, better uh, pricing. Not just the private equity funds, even corporates have now started using this extensively. Uh, it started off for corporates when they were doing cross-border acquisitions. So when they were acquiring assets outside of India, uh, they had started using it given it was a new geography that they were entering and they thought this product will be helpful. But now it's reached a place where corporates, even for the domestic transactions are using it. And like Simone said, it basically helps them get a clean uh, solution which helps transfer the risk of any unknown losses that might happen because of the breach of a rep to the insurance company rather than going after the, the seller. Now, um, this also means that the product is now so well acceptable that, that 
number of Indian insurance companies provide the product. They still don't have the skill set. What I mean is they still don't have teams who provide this insurance, but they all have the, 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 the regulatory paperwork done such that they can participate along with the reinsurers, along with the insurers outside of India. And we have been able to seamlessly provide insurance for uh, Indian corporates, for private equity funds across the board. So it is no longer product which is now easily available for all sorts of M&A transactions. Um, coming to the topic of corporate, it's one of the uh, you know main discussion points on everything that we're discussing right now, and we've been getting a lot of inquiries about how does the current uh, you know COVID situation impact WNI policy. Uh, like all insurance policies, even WNI policy is getting impacted by COVID. What that means is that insurers, all insurers globally, and this is not just India, but all insurers, irrespective of the geography they provide insurance for, are actually now excluding uh, any losses which might be arising because of uh, COVID situation. So what that means is that if tomorrow there is a loss that happens because of COVID, uh, because of because the loss increased because of COVID, it could be a bodily injury, it could be business interruption, it could be business downturn. Uh, all those situations are actually not going to get picked up by a WNI policy because of the fact that this is now being considered as a business risk. It's it's not a situation which is an unknown to anybody. Uh, everybody globally is being affected by it. And what insurers are now expecting you is that this is now part of your business assessment. So the level of diligence that you need to do while you're acquiring an asset needs to cover the impact of COVID type situations. It is not a one off anymore. It will impact businesses as we all know. And therefore the, the position that the insurers have taken is that uh, any loss arising because of COVID will not be covered. This basically means that a higher level of scrutiny diligence needs to be done by the buyer. Not just uh, is it to do with losses of business interruption or you know bodily injury, business downturn, but also situations where because of act of government, action of government, sanctions by government or any regulatory authorities might impact the business which is relating to COVID. So all these situations will actually becoming will start becoming an exclusion for policies. The policies I'm doing currently, even policies that started much before COVID started, which haven't been placed yet, uh, insurers have now uh, started adding in COVID as an exclusion. Understood. So uh, just to I'm just thinking about an example uh, where COVID related rep can get breached. And I think one of the things could be where uh, the, when the financial statements are prepared, there is always a representation that is given that uh, the financial statements are true and fair and, uh, 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 you know, uh, give complete picture of the assets and liabilities of the company. Now, there may be a situation where a receivable amount has been shown in the balance sheet as recoverable, but proper provisioning has not been done for the uh, re receivable on account of uh, COVID, which is going to be written off. So are you saying that in that situation, if that receivable is actually written off later, but that provision has not been made, and because that re recoverable has not, uh, uh, recovery has not happened on account of COVID related event, uh, that's something that won't be covered by the policy? Yes, I would expect so. Still, obviously, very early days for us as well. The situation is unfolding. We have started now seeing exclusion. So the real impact of in terms of individual reps that get impacted by COVID, yes, uh, it's something which we'll, we'll know in the next three to six months. But you're absolutely right. Basically, if the short answer is that if there is a breach of a particular rep, which is the loss trigger for a, for the policy to pay up, if the trigger of the if the rep got breached because of some underlying COVID related situation because of a COVID related uh, you know circumstances, then insurers will not be paying for it because they're saying that this is such a big event uh, globally that your diligence that the buyer does needs to take into account that what would be the impact of COVID on the business be because it's no longer any industry specific. It is no longer geography specific. It's it's pandemic as we know and therefore it's part of the business risk. And so therefore if any of the reps can get breached because of COVID type situation, uh, they will actually not pay for it. They want situation where the losses happen not because of COVID but the otherwise uh, you know day to day operations and that's what they will cover. But they don't want a situation where the the breach happens because of a COVID related uh, event. Understood. So I think it will be interesting to see how some of these things are made objective because it's very difficult to figure out whether 
the debtor has not been able to pay on account of covid uh, related situation or on account of some other situation so we'll see how this unfolds but it's quite interesting uh, based on what you are saying and uh, we'll have to see how this unfolds uh, going forward uh, but the only other thing i like yeah go ahead sorry just one thing the only good news here is that the owners of establishing whether the insurers are going to pay or not is on the insurance company so to your point if the insurers are and i paying losses because of covid they will have to prove it to the insured that they are not paying a particular breach was resultant of a covid situation so the good news is the onus is not on the insured on the buyer to establish that if it is it is on the insurance company that if they are denying a claim then they will have to prove it that it was because of underlying covid situation so that's that's something which is good uh, good news for the for the insured sorry Understood. okay no so i think a uh, uh, couple of other questions uh, what what are generally the premiums which are uh, charged for placing this policies and uh, second question was in your experience of having placed this policy for last 8 to 10 years uh, has there been any notification of a claim uh, by any of the buyers or the sellers uh, in indian pmna deals uh, to the insurance company and has insurance company actually made any payout to the insured? Sure, so, sure. So let me answer the first bit of the question, which is more on the commercial. So warranty indemnity insurance is a limit of liability policy, which means the client decides what limit they want to buy. Typically, we see this as a percentage of the deal value, just the way you would commercially agree what the indemnity cap is going to be in the SPA. Similarly, the clients decide commercially, the buyer and sellers decide commercially as to what the what the limit is going to be. Our experience tells us uh, in India and in Asia, typically, uh, we see anywhere between 20-25% of the deal value as being taken as, as the limit. Now, again, this is just a, a basis our experience. As the deal becomes larger, we've seen a smaller number, so it could change. So generally speaking, we see 20, 25% of the deal value being taken as the limit. And therefore the premium is a percentage of the limit that you take. So uh, very broadly speaking in India, uh, without obviously knowing the industry and various other parameters on the transaction, generally speaking, it's about two to 3%, but mostly two to one and a half percent of the limit you buy as a one-time premium. The policy will cover you for seven years of fundamental warranties. As Simone mentioned what these warranties are, seven years of fundamental warranties. It will cover you for seven years for tax warranties, and it will cover you three years for your business or your general warranties. So it's a one-time premium, and two to one and a half percent is a good estimate to keep in mind uh, for, for the Indian, Indian market. Now, uh, coming to uh, your uh, question regarding uh, the claims and how it's been in India, Obviously, I, I'll have to be, a, it's a little sensitive information on confidentiality reasons. I can't share too much, but what I can tell you is that the good news about these policies are they are claims made policies, which means that as long as a notification of the loss happens within these periods of the policy, uh, you know, depending on which sort of a rep gets breached, uh, the actual loss can happen many years later. So as you just need to, if it's a, if it's a business or a general rep that gets breached, you just need to notify it within the three year period because that's the period of coverage. That's the statute of limitation as per Indian law. But the loss can happen, say, six, seven, eight, ten years later down the line and the insur uh, insurance company will pay. That's point one. Just from an experience perspective, we have seen some notifications in India. Good news, bad news. I don't know how you put it. There have been far lesser uh, notifications, claims in India than the rest of the world. I think it's more to do with the fact that it's a very private equity driven product in India. Uh, I guess better, better advisory. Uh, and it's also uh, we're starting to see an increase in the notification. So I think it's just the earlier phase right now, and we will probably see more more uh, situations. But in India specific, what I have seen is actually a couple of fraud losses uh, which have been notified. In one case, it was a manufacturing setup where uh, after the buyer bought the asset, it was a large private equity fund. They thought the books of accounts don't add up. There's channel stuffing. The uh, the inventories were were cooked. So they've actually had one of the big force to do forensic accounting there. So that's one which is currently in notification. There's another one which was in pharmaceutical uh, sector where there has been a notification on fraud, which is related to compliance with law. So right now, again, it's very, as you appreciate, compliance with law is a larger area to, to uh, diligence. But yeah, it sounds like there was some fraud situation where there was some misrepresentation done. So again, uh, Big Four is, is evaluating that situation. There have been some small stamp duty type losses as well. Uh, but uh, globally, we've seen some very large claims, uh, including uh, there was a there was a large policy which was uh, over a about seven eight hundred million dollar policy for a multi billion dollar deal. Uh, there was a Chinese subsidiary in that uh, in that transaction. 
uh, it was a private equity, one of the big boys of the world who was the sellers. And the Chinese subsidiary actually had uh, off balance sheet liabilities. Uh, and there were actors who were staged as vendors, apparently. So the entire $800 million of, of the limit has got wiped clean by that one loss. I can give you some global examples, but, but these are catastrophic policies. They are taken for two reasons. One is obviously commercially when buyers and sellers are not being able to agree. So that's the main reason you take it. And then typically if loss doesn't happen that often, but when it happens, it's uh, the severe losses happen where the magnitude is a lot higher. Understood. Uh, so just to pick up on the point uh, with respect to the premium for the benefit of the audience, uh, when we say 2% on the cover, uh, you know, so assume if it's a $500 million deal, 20% is the limit which has been agreed for the purpose of business warranties. Uh, that means that 20% of 500 million comes to $100 million. And on that, two or two and a half percent is charged, which means your premium comes to somewhere between two million to two and a half million dollars. Uh, and, and that's something which, uh, you know, is either borne by the buyer or the seller, depending on the negotiation between them. And the second important point with Mandira mentioned, which is, which is good news for the acquirers uh, who are taking this policy, is that even though commercially as acquirer, you may have negotiated with the seller that the uh, limitation period or the indemnity period for uh, breach of business is two years. If the insurance is taken, you automatically get a step up of one more year, which is up to three years. So even if there is a, a third party claim which comes between the second year and the third year, the insurance policy will cover that claim uh, in spite of the fact that your share purchase agreement may not cover that claim because the indemnity period is two years. So that's also something which is quite uh, helpful for the acquirer. Uh, let me go to Abhinav. Uh, uh, Abhinav, while policy is uh, uh, important from a seller's perspective because the seller does not have to take any post-exit risk, but are there any exclusions from the policy which the sellers need to be aware of uh, so that uh, they are not caught off guard uh, thinking that, you know, every risk is being taken up by the insurer. So can you share your thoughts on that? And I think with that risk, uh, answer to that question, what I try to do is also, also try to take Divya Sharma's question to the uh, panel here. So I think every insurance policy has a number of exclusions, as I think Mandira was mentioning about COVID being one as well now. Uh, these exclusions, what these exclusions primarily do is to ensure that if any loss arises on account of these specified exclusions, which are agreed upfront and put into the policy document itself, the insurer is not liable. So if any liability uh, emerges tomorrow and the insured wants to make it needs to be clear that such insurance claim is not derived or is not as a result of any of the exclusions. If it is a result of the exclusions, the insurer is not liable. Uh, now these exclusions are numerous, as I think Divya also points out here. Uh, these are general and these are specific. Uh, general exclusions are more in the nature of aspects which uh, are, you know, exclusions irrespective of the kind of industry that the uh, target company is in or is respective of the kind of policy premium, the, the policy coverage that you're taking. These are, uh, you know, more in the nature of aspects like uh, any loss arising out of asbestos or pollution, uh, pension underfunding, secondary tax liability, transfer pricing, forward looking statements, punitive damages. These are generally general exclusions. Of course, they may be different for different insurers as well. Uh, then there are specific exclusions, which include stuff like anti-bribery, product liability in case of a manufacturing company, environmental concerns, cyber data protection, etc. Uh, now, these specific uh, exclusions, as I mentioned, could be excluded for sectors. For example, I know we were doing one transaction which was with respect to an IT company, and cyber data could not possibly be a you know exclusion there for obvious reasons. So we heavily negotiated that with the insurer, and ultimately. Uh, considering the fact that the purchaser who was uh, obtaining the policy there had taken adequate steps to ensure that the, uh, you know, cyber pro the cyber uh, mechanism and the technology of the company was proper, the insurer agreed to drop the particular exclusion. But as I mentioned, the specific exclusions are very case to case specific and is not something which, uh, you know, you would be able to identify upfront. 
uh, another exclusion which becomes very very relevant are known issues now known issues are aspects that you know for example if you're doing a buy side policy uh, the purchaser would have undertaken a detailed diligence on various aspects of the company including legal financial in some cases environmental insurance diligence etc depending on the kind of sector if it's a say a uh, uh, you know infrastructure road sector or technical or traffic diligence as well so what basically happens is that the insurer looks at all these diligence reports uh, and considers all the points that have been identified in these policies as a as an overall exclusion so the insurer would not go and identify each of the issue it would just mention that all the issues that were known to the buyer are an exclusion at the time of making a claim uh, the insurer would go through the diligence reports and the data room etc to see if the purchaser knew about it and if it did know about it it would con be considered an exclusion now i think uh, and also along with this initial take up the question that divya has posed to the group uh, is it really helpful for the usual indemnities uh, for rnw insurance uh, as opposed to the indemnities given under the agreement uh, i think the answer to that is yes and as i think mandira was pointing out the number of uh, policies increasing is a very very good uh, response or a practical uh, empirical reaction to that question however in terms of you know how the deal actually plays out in any pe or m and transaction what happens is that you know there may be certain liabilities which arise which are unknown now if it's a known issue that is identified in the diligence report the insurer is taking a practice insurer is of the view that you know the parties in good faith decided that the particular known issue or the risk is something that they are willing to live with and that is not something which needs to be covered per se however in uh, reps and warranties generally are intended to cover unknown issues and the indemnities are supposed to back those uh, liabilities arising out of unknown issues i think that is where the biggest chunk of the purpose of indemnities comes in and i think that's why in rnw insurance is still very important as opposed to indemnity uh, i think this is one more thing which i'll take along with this is you know retention whenever you take an insurance policy there is an upfront amount which the parties need to pay before the insurer becomes liable and i think the reason for that is largely similar to skin in the game where if there is a loss uh, you know a first a portion of that needs to be borne by you rather than you passing on the entire loss to the insurer now this retention amount could be low compared say at times it's 1% of ev i think mandira will also be able to guide us better on that but it's generally what we've seen is 1% of ev and in some cases where only fundamental warranties are being uh, you know backed by the wni insurance uh, there is there are no retention policies as well uh, which also takes us back to the question that the point that simon was mentioning about heavily negotiating the reps and warranties uh, these two aspects as to who bear the exclusions the liability arising from exclusions and who bears the retention also becomes very important and is commercially agreed upfront itself so uh, in nutshell what you are saying abhinav is that uh, typically uh, the warranty and indemnity insurance is helpful for unknown risk since known risk is always an exclusion and that's something with all insurances even if you go and take a medical claim if there is some disease that you have then uh, you know the insurer is not going to insure that so it's only for any unknown disease which comes up for which you get the insurance so uh, that's important but i think the more important point here or uh, what i heard you saying is that a uh, fraud by the seller will also be covered in the policy if that fraud is unknown to the buyer at the time is doing the deal and that uh, is one single most reason why this policy becomes very very important and uh, just to give you an example in the same ranbaxi daichi case uh, the internal assessment report with respect to the uh, data that was falsified was not something that was in the knowledge of daichi which was acquiring ranbaxi and at that time uh, let's say if a similar policy was taken then it would have got covered in the seller fraud uh, uh, inclusion in the policy and daichi would have been able to get uh, you know this uh, indemnification amount from the insurance company much faster than what they are uh, right now struggling to get from the uh, sing brothers so 
clearly this is, as you mentioned i think this is covered in buy side policies but not in sell side policy so a lot of times what we've seen is when you know mna deals are being negotiated even though the premium and the policy is to be obtained by the seller the policy is actually structured as a buy side policy to give the buyer additional comfort that you know the seller's fraud is going to be covered under the buy side policy understood okay uh, let me move to the next question on uh, uh, the typical question which again comes up from the clients and uh, maybe both mandira and abhinav you can answer this is at what stage should the buyer or the seller approach marsh uh, for placement of the policy because as we understand there is due diligence which is also undertaken by the insurance company to through a law firm and uh, an accounting firm and that might take some time so what's the right stage at which the insurance company should be approached and how does this go hand in hand with the a uh, share purchase agreement or the business transfer agreement which is getting negotiated between the buyer and the seller so mandira you can take it first sure sure uh, nishal so um i think the idea of the wni policy is because it's a transaction specific insurance the underwriters who underwrite these policies are actually ex corporate mna lawyers guys like you so they understand the need to move at the same pace as with the transaction moves uh, at no point can you have an insurance policy delaying the the mna transaction itself and we've we've never had a situation where a transaction has got delayed because of insurance not being placed that's point 1 which also means that it's important that we run the the insurance uh, process placement process alongside with how your transaction is moving i think the the best time to start uh, discussing with the insurance companies is when your say second draft of your spa is available you know once both the sides sides have looked at the spa at least once it becomes a little bit more balanced document typically your starting spa of course is going to be a little too buyer friendly or seller friendly depending on who's you know the first uh, you know who's circulating the spa draft so uh, the entire process is uh, divided into two phases the first phase is of course getting the terms we've been discussing pricing retention coverage exclusions the good thing is that we can approach the insurance market get all these terms from the insurers for no cost there is absolutely no cost involved and what the insurers will also do is they will provide a commentary on the spa from a coverage perspective they will actually give commentary on what reps they'll cover what reps need to be amended a bit for them to be uh, to be able to cover maybe because they're too widely drafted uh, you know maybe it has some language which doesn't uh, work with them from a coverage perspective and and all the commercials this process typically takes about say 4 5 days to get get the terms so typically when you're in the early stages of your spa discussion one should do this once you are slightly more progressed on your mna transaction is when the underwriting should be done uh the underwriting is basically the process where the insurers will also review the information to make sure they're comfortable with the transaction so far they've only seen the sp and obviously they need to see a lot more information given that literally the risk of the seller is being transferred to the insurance company so the underwriting phase typically lasts about 2 weeks 2 to 3 weeks typically and during this time what they will be doing is they will be doing a confirmatory diligence you know very 30000 feet diligence it's not like they're reinventing the wheel it's not like they'll go after the sellers or the target company for more information all that the buyer needs to do is provide the diligence reports they will review that report and provide their questions information that is missing any clarification things that they need because this is the only way they will get comfortable with the transaction alongside with the policy negotiation so the underwriting done by the insurer doesn't take more than 4 5 6 business days at best but it's also the policy negotiations because like we discussed this is a bespoke transaction specific policy what that means is that unlike your other forms of insurances which is off the shelf you know you'll buy a motor policy you'll buy a health policy which the insurance company will give your wni policy is actually negotiated to the t so you want to make sure your definitions in your spa tie in with the definitions in the policy how your coverage position gets uh, this thing so the process works parallelly and this whole negotiation typically takes 2 weeks so typically 3 weeks to have the policy in place which ties in with the most aggressive spa negotiations as well uh i mean i don't know if you've had a similar experience and and if you have any comments on how you've seen mna transaction uh, where insurance is being uh, uh, contemplated mandira i completely agree with you being on both sides of the transaction on different ones one being the counsel to the parties who are seeking the insurance and the other being you know the uh, you know counsel for the insurer it is uh, what you mentioned timelines are you know quite uh, short considering that as you right you mentioned that the insurance cannot draw down, draw the transaction to be you know signed later uh, what 
needs to be kept in mind is that the transaction, each insurance policy is bespoke and everything can be negotiated in the transaction. Uh, there are certain policy aspects or procedural aspects of the insurer, which also in a couple of transactions we managed to, you know, tinker a little bit, uh, not much because of administrative concerns only. Uh, with respect to the exclusions, etc., you know, in the process, there are two or three rounds of discussion that happen with the insurer, including an underwriting call, where the insurer points out concerns it has with the diligence undertaken by the, uh, you know, parties to the transaction. And I think that is something which is a very critical aspect of the insurance policy process where, you know, if you are able to give the insurer comfort for the concerns that the insurer raises, uh, the insurer is more likely to knock off those exclusions than to keep them. I think that's something that's very critical in the insurance policy process to ensure that, you know, the exclusions are kept to a minimal by way of multiple negotiations. Uh, I think one that will also be helpful for uh, you know, the viewers to know if the policy kicks in only mandatorily at the closing day of the transaction or are there options where, you know, the policy could also kick in at the date of signing of the transaction itself. Sure. Uh, I think great question. And I think it is uh, the good news is that we can actually incept the policy at signing itself, which means whenever your transaction is, is, is getting executed, you can actually incept the policy, bind the policy alongside uh, your signing, which is typically what we do on most of our transactions. And then you actually get covered between signing and closing where the premiums are actually due post closing. So what that means is that if you sign, say, on 1st of January, but your transaction closes on 1st of March, the premiums are actually to be paid there is a there are typical clauses in a policy it's anywhere between 10 to 20 business days to pay the premium post closing so post first of march you have that much time to make the premium payment but actually covers between signing and closing as well that's 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 an advantage that we recommend most of our clients the only caveat i like to make here is there is a bit of a regulatory challenge when it comes to india uh, if the insured is an indian domicile what i mean by that is if the policy the, the beneficiary or the insured in the policy document is an indian entity then there is a bit of a regulatory challenge because in india irda doesn't allow you to incept the policy unless you pay the premium now if if that is the situation then either the client will have to pay the premium at signing which a lot of times people don't want to do because people only want to pay the premiums when closing has happened when the monies have been transferred so in those situations, uh, the policy inception happens at, uh, at closing, again, by the choice of the, by the insured. Uh, but otherwise, a lot of my policies are taken where the insured the, uh, uh, entity is an NR entity, a non-resident Indian entity. And in those cases, we can actually incept the policy at signing itself and take benefit for no additional cost for between signing and closing as well. Thanks, Mandira, for that. So I think we've talked about, you know, all kinds of policies, but, uh, you know, especially uh, pre-2017, um, the questions that, uh, that were asked to us uh, multiple times is really from, from a Mauritius perspective, um, what really happens? Uh, and can you, and, and why else do you may get a rep and warranty insurance for business reps and for fundamental reps? What really happens um, with respect to tax withholding? Uh, that is a liability really on the acquirer. And how does the acquirer sort of, you know, protect itself? And given the change in law, and now that, you know, the treaties have actually changed, um, is there, um, you know, has this policy really gone for a toss? Um, and, or or is, there, is this something that continues to, um, you know, be, be availed or should be availed of by acquirers? So uh, just for the benefit of the audience, uh, just like there is a warranty and indemnity policy, there is also a tax insurance policy which can be used, uh, which can be taken by the buyer in PMA transactions. And this policy ensures the buyer against any potential withholding tax claim that could be raised by the Indian tax department. So as per the Indian laws, when the buyer is uh, buying shares of an Indian company from a seller, and the seller is liable to pay capital gains tax in India on that transaction. The buyer has an obligation to withhold that tax before paying the consideration to the seller. And the tax department typically first chases the buyer uh, before it uh, chases the seller in these type of transactions. Now, the problem with the buyer is uh, once the seller is exited uh, 
and no tax was withheld at the time of payment, how does the buyer recover the taxes from the seller uh, and pay to the tax department in case the capital gains tax liability is held to be valid? And uh, uh, there it became important on, uh, it becomes important to see whether the uh, seller had acquired shares prior to 31st of March 2017 or not, because uh, from 1st of April 2017, India, Mauritius, India, and, uh, and India, Singapore renegotiated the tax treaties. Uh, and uh, India basically took away the capital gains tax exemption, which was provided to Mauritius entities and Singapore entities investing in India, which means any investment by uh, Singapore or Mauritius entities in India post 1st of April 2017 will have to uh, pay Indian capital gains tax when they exit from India. But why this tax insurance policy still remains important is because of the fact that the typical cycle for any investment by a PE fund in India is at least five to seven or maybe 10 years in certain situations, which means there are many investments which were made prior to 2017 and which will uh, continue to exit at least till 2024, 2025. And that's where these policies will continue to be important because uh, if the investment has been made by those seller entities prior to 31st March 2017, then they are still eligible to avail of the benefits under the India Mauritius Tax Treaty or India Singapore Tax Treaty. And that's where uh, uh, there is a negotiation which happens between the buyer and seller at the time of exit, where the buyer has four or five choices. One is to or rely on that indemnity provided by the seller. Second is to hold back an amount and put it in escrow. Uh, and as and when there is a final adjudication by the tax department on the tax, that money is released to the buyer or the seller. The third is uh, usually a tax opinion is also taken. And the fourth important uh, remedy uh, or uh, something that is used is nil withholding order from the tax department. So the seller approaches the tax department or the buyer can approach the tax department and ask for a nil withholding order from tax department and that this transaction being uh, uh, being undertaken from Mauritius or Singapore is uh, uh, eligible to avail of treaty benefits and hence no tax should be deducted. Now what we have seen as a practical compromise is that in certain cases nil withholding orders have worked but in most of the cases uh, because of the time that the tax department takes to revert, it's not something that has been considered as a practical solution. Withholding tax anyways is not a practical solution because the sellers are eligible to avail of the treaty benefits. Uh, escrow holdback again is something that does not work for the buyer because it reduces the, their IRRs over a period of time where money is just lying in uh, escrow uh, without it being used for any productive purpose. Uh, and uh, indemnity is the option which is most used in the m &A deals uh, for tax uh, uh, withholding. And uh, that's where to back that indemnity claim, uh, tax insurance is taken because in case the private equity fund is selling in that situation because they have limited life and given the fact under the Indian tax laws, the tax department can uh, chase the seller at least for a period of, uh, uh, you know, for a, not at least uh, for a period of seven years uh, from the end of the financial year and with the transaction took place. Uh, hence, it's important that the seller entity has the ability to pay if any withholding tax claim comes, even after the period it is wound up. Now, how do you ensure that? The only way to ensure that is that get a tax insurance policy so that the seller entity can also wind up and uh, obligation to pay tax in case something comes up is passed on to the insurance company. And here what we have seen is uh, uh, typically 2X to 3X is the range which is uh, usually considered as appropriate range uh, for negotiation between the buyer and the seller. So let's say there is a, a $100 million deal where the gains are $50 million. Uh, on that $50 million, let's say the capital gains tax rate is 10%, which means $5 million is the tax rate. So 
So typically, interest and penalties are also factored in the 2x and 3x uh, cap, which I just mentioned. So assume if 2x cap is factored, then $5 million capital gains tax, 2x of that comes to $10 million. And on that, the premium is applied and uh, Mim Mandira would be able to share with us what's the current premium range, but uh, it used to be 6 to 8% or sometimes 7 to 9% in certain situations. So assume if it is, let's say, uh, 8%, uh, then 8% of uh, $10 million is something, uh, you know, uh, $800,000 will be the premium in this situation. So uh, while the law has changed post 2017, but the fact that there are many investments uh, made by PE funds uh, prior to 31st March 2017, and uh, some of them have exited, some of them will exit over the next four to five years. The tax insurance as a policy uh, will still be uh, very pertinent for some of these exits. Hi, this is Mandra. Just, 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 hey, Mandra, so just one good news. Yeah, okay, please. Sorry, just one good news on the premiums. They have actually come down because uh, one less of uh, exits need insurance because obviously as you're moving away from 2017, exits are happening. You're absolutely right. It will be uh, needed to continue providing this product because there are a number of grandfathered exits, which were, which uh, in grandfather investments, which happened before April 1st, 2017, which are now going to be exited. But the premiums have significantly come down. The current range is about closer to four to six percent. So say about five percent if you want to take an average, four to six percent of the yeah. same limit. Absolutely right on the limit that you calculated. But the pricing used to be a lot higher, six, eight, ten percent. I've even done as high as fourteen percent in, in in some times. But currently, the pricing is between four to six percent. Sorry, uh, Abhinav, you were asking the question. So, Madhur, I think that's very good to know. I think a related point. Uh, you know, have you seen any claims on tax insurance policies being made? And I think a similar question to what we asked you earlier. Do you think COVID will have any impact on tax insurance policies as well? Let's take the easy uh, question first. Uh, I don't see any uh, Im uh, impact of COVID on a tax policy. Tax policies are just to cover the capital gains that are made by, by the seller on their exit and if they are to pay taxes or not. And that is all to do with whether they have permanent establishment in the in the jurisdiction and the treaty that they're using. So I don't see any impact of COVID uh, on, on a tax policy, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, on the claims part, um, again, there have been very few notifications. It is not something which is uh, which we've seen a lot. Fewer notifications on the number of policies we've done. And these have been on various accounts. One, for example, has been on a situation where it was an auto-generated notice by the tax authorities because they thought the calculation done by them was incorrect in terms of the the you know when they were filing the returns. So that was one situation I have seen. Uh, the other more common situation we've seen is that a number of times these policies are taken is because they're private equity sellers and they need to wind up. Um, so when winding up, they actually require to take, you know, certificate or no objection certificate from the tax authorities. Now, when they do that in those situations, a lot of times tax authorities start asking a number of questions. They ask clarifications, they ask information. And these are all situations that which are sort of like notification because any of these things can result in a loss just because if tax authorities start, uh, uh, you know, looking at something with 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 a, with a closer lens, they might start, you know, asking further information. So we call all of these things as notification under the policy. Uh, there have been some loss as well under the policy, which means there was there was a ruling that they need to pay pay tax, and which is now being challenged at higher authorities. So one of the things in these policies is that you don't. Uh, advancement of tax is paid up by the policy grounds up, which means if you get a notice in India, you need to pay some amount 10, 20 percent of any notice and then contest it. So those amounts have actually been paid on in on, on a few occasions and they're currently in in uh, litigation. So we have some situations far and few. I'm not going to say there have been lots, but yeah, there have been a few, but most of the policies actually have not. Thanks, Mandira. Um, uh, I think it was quite uh, useful uh your all your practical inputs uh with this we conclude the session and uh, uh once again thanks to all the participants who have joined this webinar and hope you found the session useful thank you thank you very much for having me thank you very much